Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Explain This. This is a very special edition of Explain This. I've got our guest here, Alex Gardner. Alex, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. I am so glad you're here. We just met, and I get to learn all about you today. Alex yes. Gardner's from Alex Gardner Nutrition. Explain a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, so I am a registered and licensed dietitian nutritionist, a certified lactation counselor, and a community health education specialist. Oh and gosh. so as dietitians, we are trained to be able to help clients in any aspect of, of nutrition, whether that be cancer, whether that be diabetes, whether that be renal disease. Mm. But a lot of us specialize. Mm. And so I have taken to specialize in the perinatal side of things. And when I say perinatal, that encompasses fertility, pregnancy, and postpartum. So it's all three of those kind of transition periods. Now, they're all three very distinct periods, but they run together very well. Mm. Um, so that's a little bit about my passion. And I've been doing that for about two and a half years in private practice. Rock on. Um, so it's really great because when you're able to um, niche down to that level, you're able to really educate yourself on the very nitty gritty aspects of yeah. those um, specific physiological states that you're looking at. Did you know that that's what you wanted to specialize in? Like, how did that come about? So, backstory, when I was a sophomore in high school, I took a nutrition class and okay. I fell in love with the profession. Um, but it wasn't until we did our internship. So as dietitians, we're required to do a year long internship before we pass our exam. And I did a 10 week WIC rotation. So for those that don't know, WIC is the very long name is the special supplemental nutrition assistance program for women, infants, and children, but it's abbreviated as WIC. I'll stick uh, with WIC. <laughs> <laughs> and so that is where I really fell in love with working with, um, pregnant and postpartum moms. And then I went into grad school for my master's of public health, and I was offered a position as a maternal and child health nutrition leadership trainee funded by the Maternal and Child Health Bureau of HRSA through mm. the University of Tennessee. So for two years, I was um, enhancing my skills as a maternal and child health uh, mm. nutrition leader. Mm. So that's where I really honed in and focused and realized that this was my love. Well, nutrition is, it's so important, but I would imagine it's even more important during those three periods that you're talking about that women go through. And can you tell me those again? It's preconception? It's um, the fertility, so the preconception, Okay. The, the pregnancy or the prenatal, and then the postpartum, so the after pregnancy. Okay. And how long can that take? Like, is it, I know it varies, I'm sure. So. Because that's a, it seems like that could be a a minute. Well, um, I had someone ask, <laughs> I'm currently pregnant and I said, well, thank you. That's amazing. I said, well, the baby's due in, in July and they're like, of this year or next year? And I'm like, well, um, I'm not an elephant. Uh, elephants are pregnant for two years. <laughs> um, that humans, would definitely be a question I would ask. Like humans, what, year is, what, what year? Well, humans, we are pregnant for 40 weeks, which technically is 10 months, not nine. So you're pregnant for 10. Um, so <laughs> you're pregnant for 10 months. And then that's the, a, that's a hot take right there. Uh, <laughs> yes. It's not nine. It's not nine months. <laughs> it's 10. <laughs> um, and then by the time you have your baby in America, you are checked off at six weeks and you're like, Oh, you're fine. No, the postpartum period is usually about two years until oh, you really? really start to feel yourself again. Your hormones really start to go to where they need to be. So it's really like a three year period. No kidding. And that's why we recommend women wait 18 to 24 months before getting pregnant with a, their second child or their subsequent child, because that gives their body time to fully recover postpartum mm. before they start that journey again. Now, when it comes to the fertility side of things, that varies for different people. Right. Some people they don't even have to try to get pregnant. They accidentally get pregnant. Mm. Um, and so they don't really even have much of a fertility period where some women are trying for years and years and years and years and are struggling with infertility. So it really varies on that side of things mm. of how long a mom is in that kind of phase. Postpartum can, is, is two years. Mm -hmm. Two years uh, post-birth. Uh, mm -hmm. Wow, that's unreal. So, three, so, so in general, around three years, not including the fertility. Correct. Wow. So you're, I mean, you're a big part of your clients' lives. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and a lot of people don't realize this, but what is happening in utero 
has a direct effect on that child for the rest of their life. Mm. So have you heard of the Dutch hunger winter? No. Okay. So during World War II, the Nazis cut off food supply to Holland for a winter. And they were basically starving. And so there were pregnant mothers during this time that were only having about like 500 calories a day. Mm. And researchers were later able to look back at these moms and the kids that were born to pregnant moms during this famine and kind of research what happened to them as they got older. And because they were born, not even born yet, but because they were developing in a starvation environment, where there was scarce food, Mm. they were predisposed to having obesity and obesity-related chronic diseases because every time that they ate something, their bodies were like, oh my God, we're going to starve, and it had to hold on to it. So that's an example of epigenetics where what happens in the in utero environment affects that child for the rest of their life. Same with gestational diabetes. If a mom has gestational diabetes, her child is more likely to develop diabetes Mm. than if she did not have gestational diabetes. Same with the fact, and a lot of people don't realize this, but it makes sense when when you hear it, women are born with all of their eggs for conception. So I'm currently pregnant with a little girl, And right now my little girl is developing all the eggs that she's gonna have for the rest of her life, AKA the genetic material for her children. So not only am I creating my daughter, but I'm creating the genetic material for all of her children. Wow. Yes. That is a ton of responsibility. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Goodness gracious. I I actually did not realize that about um, one, the hunger crisis, but I totally see how that would lead to obesity because your body is like there's not coming in i gotta you know utilize everything i would Mm -hmm. have thought they you know you'd be more likely to to be thin Mm -hmm. you know if you were in utero in that environment Mm -hmm. that's fascinating yes and so we have certain genetics that we at conception genetics don't change but can depending on the environment that you're in and and the uterus is a type of environment it turns on certain genes or turns off certain genes Mm. and so that's where you get that epigenetics where nutrition plays into turning certain genes on or turning certain genes off that lead to health problems or health prosperity down the down the road so turning on or off those certain genes in the mother or in the baby in the baby in the baby okay Mm -hmm. the the way that the mother is eating Mm -hmm. during fertility both actually during pregnancy and fertility so a lot of times men don't think they have much of a role when it comes to the health of their child Mm. but sperm are the genetic makeup of a person. So like you have the egg and the sperm and when they come together, that's the genetic makeup. After conception, there is no changing the genetic makeup. So for men and women, the three to six months prior to conception is the most important time for optimizing egg and sperm health because prior, prior to conception, okay. because it takes about three months for egg and sperm to fully mature. And you want the most optimal quality egg and sperm that you can have And egg and sperm are just cells. And like any other cells in the body, they're impacted by lifestyle and nutrition. So for example, if a man is not really active, if he's drinking a lot of alcohol, if he's having a lot of processed foods, if there's a lot of environmental toxins going on, that can decrease not only the quantity of sperm, but the quality of sperm. Mm. And I say this all the time, like your partner, your male partner could be fertile, but what about the quality of that, that genetic material that's going to make the baby? Mm. So men can actually have a prenatal vitamin. There's specific prenatals for men, but when my husband and I were realizing we wanted to try to conceive, the six months prior to us saying, okay, it's time, I had him on a very strict prenatal vitamin regimen. <laughs> um, shout out to your husband. <laughs> yes. I love your husband. What's your husband's name? Trevor. Trevor. Shout out to yeah. Trevor. <laughs> But he was on, um, there was a little bit of a kind of me concocting different things based on his lifestyle, his diet, and then what we needed to supplement with. And that's the same with everybody. Everybody has a different lifestyle. Everybody has a different diet. Everybody has a different medical condition. So they have a specific kind of 
um, way that they need to combine things. So there's no one specific vitamin for every person because mm. every person is a little bit different. Right. And that's why working with a fertility dietitian is so important because we can take a look at, okay, where are the gaps? Mm. I have people come to me all the time that are like, oh, well, I eat pretty healthy, so why do I need to see a dietitian? And yeah, you probably do eat pretty healthy, but I can take a look and, and pretty fast notice the holes. Yes. So a big thing that I see a lot of times is a lack of iodine. Iodine's a mineral. A hundred years ago, we used to, um, we started I fortifying salt with iodine. So we iodized salt. Now we have a lot of people coming away from that and doing Himalayan salt or this designer salt or non-iodized salt. Now, if you have a thyroid issue, that's okay. You probably don't need that extra iodine, but for the general population, we are not consuming that iodized salt. We may be getting a lot of sodium in our diet, but that doesn't mean that sodium is iodized. Right. Most people aren't taking a vitamin, and if they are taking a vitamin, it usually doesn't have iodine in it. And then their diet is not sufficient in iodine because we don't eat a lot of seafood, we don't eat a lot of seaweed, things like that that are going to contain iodine. So that's one that I usually pick out for people. And in the first trimester, that is very, very, very important um, for baby's development. Okay, first three months of the pregnancy. Yes. Okay. okay. So there's different things where we can look at, okay, if you're trying to conceive, what do we need to consider? But one of the things that I talk to people about with fertility nutrition is we're going to pretend that you are pregnant and we're going to pretend that this is your first trimester because we don't necessarily know when you're going to get pregnant. I love the mentality. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so by the time women know that they're pregnant, they've been pregnant for four weeks. Technically. Okay. I, th I just realized this when I became pregnant. This is my first pregnancy. Um, you are technically considered pregnant two weeks before conception. <laughs> Which doesn't make sense to me because, like, the baby does not exist. So when you're four weeks pregnant, your baby has only existed for two weeks. So it, okay, okay. Uh, really? yeah, it goes off the date of your last menstrual cycle. So let's say, just to make math easy, you your period was on March 1st. You usually ovulate two weeks later. And then you usually get your pregnancy test positive two weeks after that. So that's how they get the four weeks, but really you've only been technically pregnant for two weeks. That is incredible. <laughs> kind of, I was like, what, who, the math ain't mathin'. <laughs> it's not mathin'. Um, but by the time women realize they're pregnant, they get that positive pregnancy test, they've been pregnant for four weeks. Okay. And so that's why I always tell women to just pretend like you're already pregnant and eat like you're in the first trimester and make sure you're taking the vitamins like you're in the first trimester because those absolutely most critical development happens before you get a positive pregnancy mm. test. Um, so there are things that we look at when it comes to fertility, but there's also things you want to make sure that we're covering for that very, very first trimester. And by, when you say covering w from a nutrient standpoint, yes. okay, yes. getting, like you said, with the iodine, any other supplements you, that you like people to, to have during that period? So when it comes to first trimester, Iodine, and I have a blog post on this. There's there's a couple of nutrients we want to look for, but specifically for me, I'm looking at folate, okay. which most people know, and most prenatals have folate mm -hmm. in them, so that's not an issue. Um, but we're also looking at choline. Most vitamins and prenatal vitamins don't have choline in it, or if it does, it's like a token amount. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is the iodine. So the folate, the choline, and the iodine. That's what I look for for first trimester nutrients. Okay. Now, when it comes to that, it also depends on your dietary intake. So like for some people, the, the main source of choline comes from eggs. And if people are eating a lot of dietary choline, that doesn't really matter. But for me, I'm very sensitive to eggs. When I eat eggs, I get a really bad stomach ache. So I just don't really include eggs in my diet. So I make sure I'm including an additional supplement mm. of choline because I know it's so important in pregnancy and I know I don't eat a mm. lot of choline. So th there are some things there that just because your prenatal doesn't have it doesn't mean it's the end of the world, but we need to make sure your diet includes it. So those are the things I see when it comes for specific nutrients. But if we're looking at overall dietary pattern, when it comes to fertility and first trimester pregnancy, it's about the same. And what I'm looking for is making sure that you're having five to seven servings of fruits and vegetables a day, 
which is a lot harder than you think. And this is fertility plus the first trimester. Yeah. Well, you're, you're, they're the I'm same. kind of combining them. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So five to seven servings of fruits and vegetables a day, which actually is a lot harder than you think. I would imagine that's extremely difficult. Well, the recommendation for everybody is five a day. Um, I ain't getting it. Well, the CDC, <laughs> I mean, and the CDC tells us that only 10% of Americans reach that. And I believe that because I would say of the clients I see, only 10% of the clients I see are reaching that when I first start right. working with them. Right. In Tennessee, that's even lower. The number is 9.2% um, of Tennesseans mm. are meeting the recommended uh, fruit and veggie intake. So, so five to seven fruits and vegetables or just fruits? Um, combined fruits Com and vegetables. Okay, okay. And I'm it's a you. serving. It doesn't mean you have to have five to seven different fruits and vegetables a day, but mm -hmm. a serving size. Okay. We're looking at making sure we're including lots of whole grains in the diet. Whole grains are a really important source of fiber and B vitamins. And mm. B vitamins are things like folate that are really important in that first trimester of pregnancy. Yeah. We're looking at making sure there's an adequate amount of omega-3 and DHA in the diet. That's really important for egg quality. So mm. we're making sure that we have um, minimal amounts of processed food, minimal amounts of added sugar, minimal amounts of saturated fats. Um, so really we're looking at the dietary pattern as a whole. People are going to have dessert here and there. Um, people are going to have a cheeseburger here and there. But it's when we're doing that on a daily basis that it starts to add up. Yes. And the way I practice is in a very stair-step approach. So someone might be here and their goal is to get here. But there's a lot of steps between that. Yes. And if we're here and I just give you a list of things to do, it can be really overwhelming. And a lot of people, they'll, they'll be really gung-ho for like a week. And they're like, this is too much. I can't do it. And we revert back. So we focus a lot in my sessions on, okay, what are one to three goals that are probably the most important to focus on over the next couple of weeks? And we, we focus on those. There, there's probably lots of other things we need to work on too, but we really want to prioritize like one to three things to focus on because mm. then we can, we can actually focus on them. And that might be a patient only has one to two servings of fruits and vegetables a day. And I've had this. I mean, I do have patients that have zero to one for servings of fruits and vegetables a day. And if that's the case, I'm not going to say, let's get seven. Right. I'm going to say, let's get three. Right. Let's consistently get three servings of fruits and veggies in a day. Let's brainstorm how we're going to do that. And then when we come back, we talk about what worked well and what didn't work well. Like, what were barriers to you getting to that goal? What were um, things that made it easy for you to get to that goal? Mm. So we talk about that. Mm. Because then we can kind of brainstorm and, and create some game plans of how we're going to incorporate and what's best for you. Because everybody has a different lifestyle. Yes. And then once we figure that out, we're like, okay, now let's bring it up to four. Mm. And then we'll bring it up to five. So mm. it's kind of a stair-step approach. And then maybe this person is really struggling with added sugar. Maybe they're getting 100 grams of added sugar a day, which is actually really easy to do nowadays. Um, <laughs> One <and> latte. <laughs> well, I know. And my favorite drink at Starbucks, which is a, a um, caramel apple spice, has like 70 grams of sugar. In it's it, so good. I've had it. It's, <laughs> I know. it's so good. But for women... The recommended um, cap for added sugar is six teaspoons or 24 grams, which is not a lot. And no. for men, it's nine teaspoons or 36 grams. And most people hit that by breakfast. <laughs> um, so we might look at, okay, what is it your daily intake of added sugar look like? And if you're at 100, how can we bring it down to 60? Mm. And then just kind of stair-stepping from there. So it's bringing the, the not-so-great habits down and bringing the good habits up a little bit, um, looking at an overall dietary pattern. And I'm not a fan of excluding any particular food group. <laughs> um, there are some people that say this particular diet or this particular way of eating is the best way to go. There are things that I don't agree with, like um, the carnivore diet. Mm -hmm. That is not appropriate for fertility and pregnancy, and I'll tell you why. Fruits, vegetables, and whole grains are necessary. They are full of vitamins and minerals. They are full of fiber. They are full of phytochemicals, and phytochemicals simply means plant chemicals or okay. things that you can only find in plants. That's what gives them their colors. 
So when we say eat the rainbow, it's because different colored fruits and vegetables have different chemical properties in them that work synergistically in your body in ways that you can't extract and put into a supplement. Interesting. Makes so fun, much sense, by the way. Fun stuff. <laughs> fun stuff. So when I have patients that are like hitting all the really like basic goals, we take it a little bit more advanced. We're like, okay, you need to get at least four different colored fruits and veggies a day. Now that's more advanced, okay? But if you really want to challenge yourself, that's what we go to. Go to three to four? Uh, three to four different colors okay. a day. Okay. <laughs> so you might have some blueberries or some broccoli or some cantaloupe to get those different colors in. I, I love that though, because it's, it's very easy to get a win. Like you can mm-hmm. like, okay, I need, I need a green. I need mm-hmm. a blue, mm-hmm. you know, where's my orange at? <laughs> yeah. And then you're making sure that you're getting those different phytochemicals in as well. Yeah. So if you're completely excluding any particular food group, you're really missing out on certain nutrients. Mm. Um, so like with the carnivore diet, it's all, um, all animal protein. So all dairy and all meat, and you're missing out on a lot of really important stuff. Plus that's really high in saturated fats. Um, I also don't recommend a true keto diet. A lot of people say they are doing keto, but they're not. It's like just kind of lower carb. Right. A true keto diet is like 95% fat and it is for, it is a medical therapy for children with epilepsy. And you're in ketosis constantly, Mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. Right. And that can be damaging to the body. And when we are pregnant, Carbs are our baby's preferred fuel source. Mm. So you don't want to be restricting carbs to that level. Now, there's a difference between like going a little bit lower carb, maybe not eating a ton of pastas and breads and things like that versus making sure we're having carbohydrates in the form of whole grains and fruits and vegetables um, and things like that in our diet. Those are important. Mm -hmm. Those are really important carbs. Um, But making sure we're pairing that with healthy protein and fat so our blood sugar is not going all over the place so there's some ways that we can combine this and there's not one perfect dietary pattern there are extremes and we want to be a little bit more in the middle when it comes to that kind of like taking the best of everything Mm -hmm. almost i love that approach and not like you know excluding anything in particular Mm -hmm. but getting i mean if you're trying to bring another human into the world you would you would think you would need as much of everything as you yeah, can. You do need a variety and that's what's really important. And when it comes to supplements, supplements are great, but that's what they are, a supplement to your diet. I see supplements more as a safety net. Mm. So there might be something and not everyone has a perfect diet. If you think about it, most people eat on a 2 week rotation. You eat about the same meals every 2 weeks yeah. and then you recycle those meals. Yeah. And so I can get a good sense of what people are eating because when I go do my initial assessment, I'm like, okay, what do you typically have for breakfast? And for me, I probably have four breakfasts that I rotate through. And I say, okay, what do you typically have for dinner? And they'll, they'll spew off a couple of things. And really that is like all they have for dinner. That's all that's on their rotation. And so if we're missing some things in those meals that you eat all the time, they're not in your diet. You right. may have salmon three times a year <laughs> but I'm at, I'm at the beach <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna have some seafood. it doesn't really count if we're not having it on a weekly basis and okay. so that's where we can see like taking an omega-3 supplement with dha is going to be important because this person does, really just doesn't consume a lot of fish or, and that's what you mean by the holes mm-hmm. okay yeah okay. exactly so we're able to, to see those nutrient holes um so Supplements, yes, they are important, but we want to make sure we're optimizing diet first and have those supplements as a safety net. Mm. Now, in my head, when you're counseling your clients and patients, you're really counseling almost three people, the mm-hmm. husband, the wife, or the, the male, the female, and the baby. Mm-hmm. Is how long, from a male's perspective, is it just during the fertility part where the male's nutrition is super important? Or... I'm sure there's like some sort of, you know, uh, way to, to help the mom by also eating well, mm-hmm. even during the pregnancy and postpartum. Yeah. What, what's your thoughts on that? So from a sperm perspective, the most important time is infertility because once conception happens, there's really the role, the genetic role of the male is no longer there. Okay. Um, and the reason I have to say three to six months prior is because 
it takes three months for sperm and egg to fully mature, but if we're looking at making that stair-step lifestyle approach, you're not going to be able to do that boom in one day. Right. It usually takes a couple months for you to completely implement all the things you need to implement, which right. is why I say about like six months prior, because that gives you a little bit of leeway to start making those changes and making those improvements. Now, when it comes to um, being pregnant and the male partner's role in that, the biggest thing that I see with women is they tell me, the, the biggest barrier sometimes to them eating healthy is that their husband or their male partner is not on the same page as them mm. when it comes to nutrition. Like, um, they may cook separate meals because she wants to eat one way and he wants to eat a different way. Mm. So really taking into consideration um, the lifestyle changes that the female partner is wanting to make and being supportive of that yeah. is really important because it makes it so much easier on her. Right, right, right. To have a partner in this, to... Mm-hmm. to not have to, you know, sometimes just looking, I I can look at a pizza and all of a sudden my whole week's thrown off. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. And so really having that person to, um, encourage, um, and really be on the same goals. Cause I know sometimes my husband and I will be like, should we get a pizza? Yeah, let's get a pizza (laughs) versus should we make this side, this veggie side dish? Maybe not. So you can really play off each other like you know what you should be doing but if you're just like eh, let's do this other thing it can be it can be a little bit detrimental it's not to say you can never have a pizza but it's how can we make these healthier choices now tell me tell me a little bit about like your process with patients is it you know do they need to come weekly monthly how do you typically lay out a program well first i do a a free like 30 minute zoom call where we talk about what exactly it is that they're needing some people they simply need information and then they can incorporate that themselves sure some people it's literally like let's have one session let me assess what's going on here's a list and they feel comfortable implementing that themselves yeah most people aren't like that though most people know what they need to do in general what and you know you need to eat more fruits and vegetables you know you need to drink more water you know you need to have less added sugar it's the implementation that's the hard part and in that situation having more frequent visits usually like two to three weeks apart for a couple months is is helpful during the uh any any phase any phase of any phase okay um because that helps them get to their goals. Okay. Now, of course, I'm going to be educating on things that you probably don't know about. I'm going to be talking about nutrients that you might be missing. I'm going to be talking about things we might be getting too much of. Like, for example, and this is not to scare anybody, but vitamin A, when you take too much of it, it does cause birth defects. If you've ever heard of the um, Accutane, acne yep. medication. Yep. For women, they make you sign something that says you're on two different forms of birth control and that you have to take a pregnancy test before they up your prescription because it has such a high dose of vitamin A in it that it will cause birth defects if you're pregnant and you're taking Accutane. Interesting. So it's not to say that your diet in and of itself is going to have too much vitamin A, but it's when you start supplementing Mm. that that can be a problem. So it's me looking at their foods it's me looking at their supplements it's not only seeing where there are holes but seeing if we're having too much of something that could be dangerous yeah um beef liver is another example liver is the filtering organ of the body so when you consume liver it's very high dose of vitamins and minerals which is great but if you have someone that's eating liver like every single day that can actually lead to a little bit too much vitamin A in the diet. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's not only just educating on the basic dietary pattern and getting that that dietary pattern where we need it to be, but talking about some specifics related to fertility and pregnancy and nutrition that a patient might not have known about and being able to counsel them on that as well. This might be a a weird one, but like we talk a lot about birth control and, and, you know, obviously – coming off birth control is there any, do you deal with any sort of like detox period with that or has that been a problem or uh, do you deal with that with with patients I think the biggest thing when it comes to getting off birth control is looking at your your vitamin b levels okay um but most of the time when women come to me they've been off birth control a really long time okay and so that's not something that I personally deal with a lot but it's something that I've heard about patients experiencing troubles with okay 
I also hear a lot of patients coming to me with recurrent miscarriage. Um, in that situation, I always recommend not. I like for them to get tested for the NTHFR gene mutation, which is where they are not metabolizing folate appropriately. Mm. But I usually, if someone comes to me with multiple miscarriages, I just assume they have the NTHFR gene mutation and we go on a methylated folate supplement. Um, so not necessarily that they have to get tested, but also, and this is something I was talking to my patient this morning about, a lot of people don't realize this, but undiagnosed, untreated celiac disease raises the risk of miscarriage by 900%. What? Yeah. So if you have celiac disease and it's managed, your risk for miscarriage does not change. But if you don't know you have celiac disease, then you're not managing it. Mm. And that is increasing the risk of miscarriage by nine times or 900%. Does that tell us like that we just need to stay away from gluten or? Not necessarily. Okay, so it's just, we need to know. It's just celiac disease specifically because when it comes to celiac disease, even the smallest molecule of gluten can activate it. Mm. Um, And it's just for those specific patients. And that is causing a lot of issues in, in the gut lining and it's causing the body not to absorb nutrients. And that's usually what is leading to the miscarriage is the body is not able to support Mm. a baby. And so it miscarries because it knows it can't support a baby um, because it's not really able to support itself. Wow. So that's something that the MTHFRG mutation and celiac disease that I I prefer clients that have multiple miscarriages. And what I mean by that is three or more. Um, It's not that they have those things, but it's something I want to rule out Mm. if when it comes to that from a nutrition perspective. Is it ever just best to just kind of assume, like you said, like, okay, let's let's eat a diet that, well, but then you might be losing on some nutrients. I don't you... assume celiac. I'm okay. not a big fan of necessarily taking gluten out just to take gluten out. If someone um, has celiac, yes, it's medically necessary. If someone has a gluten sensitivity, okay. Mm. Um, but for most people, I don't like necessarily going gluten-free because gluten-containing products like wheat – are whole grains and most of the time that's the main whole grain that people are including in their diet and whole grains are really important to have when you're trying to conceive and when you're pregnant because of the micronutrients that are in them like the b vitamins now of course there are other whole grains that don't have gluten gluten containing grains are wheat rye and barley but most people wheat is the the main grain that they're consuming. Right, right. And so if they don't want to have wheat, that's totally fine. But we need to talk about how we're going to implement other grains into the diet to um, kind of compensate for that. If you are with somebody kind of later in the game and you do notice some some holes, do you still stair step them? Or do you, is there like a, a situation where like, okay, we need to, we need to ramp this up? Well, <laughs> yes and no. Um, one, Most of the time I ask patients, like, based on what we've talked about, what are some things that you think would be the most important to focus on? Because if I come up with something, it might not be what they think is important, and they might not prioritize that. So first I ask, like, what is it that you you prioritize? I have some ideas of my own, but I'm curious to hear, like, what your priorities are. Then after they tell me their priority priorities, usually it lines up with what I have to say. Mm-hmm. They might be missing something. And, and one of the things I say is, okay, I totally agree with that. I do think those two things are really important to prioritize. I also would like to prioritize this, and here's why. Like maybe we're in the third trimester, and maybe we're anemic, and we need to prioritize iron. But usually they know that, and they've already identified that that's something that they want to prioritize. Okay. And so we might not focus too much on the fruit and vegetable content, and we're going to focus more on the iron content. So it really depends, and that's where it comes into play of what are the medical diagnoses? What is the lifestyle? What are the goals? Because mm. you have to have those three things to be able to figure out where you're going. Mm. I love this. I love what you do. Like it, Like it is... So it just seems like there's so many complexities. And like you said at the beginning, everyone is so different mm-hmm. that uh, I bet this is kind of like a puzzle uh, to you each and every time because everyone has different, um, you know, uh, you call them holes, nutrition mm-hmm. holes, and everyone has different you know, capabilities in terms of what they're able to activate right there. Yeah. And I'm a big, big, big believer that general information should be free. And mm. that's why on all my social media, I have a ton of educational videos on general information. But 
everybody is different and everybody really needs an individualized approach. So you can definitely go on to all my social media sites and you can implement a lot of what we're talking about. Yeah. But everybody has a different medical diagnosis. Everybody has a different lifestyle. Everybody has different goals. And so that's when it's we work together and we figure all of that out. And then we work towards whatever those goals are for you. I love it, Alex. Where can everybody find you on social? I want everybody here to go and uh, consume this content. Because uh, like you said, education is kind of that first place that they go to. Yeah, absolutely. So um, on Instagram, my handle is Alex Gardner Nutrition. Um, on Facebook, I have a free Facebook group that's I, full of educational videos on different topics of prenatal, postpartum, and uh, fertility nutrition. And that is um, the Mom and Baby Nutrition Support Group on Facebook. Um, if you go on my website, Alex Gardner, alexgardnernutrition.com, there's a link to that Facebook group. There's a link to the Instagram. Um, there's also a blog on there with great information. And then I also have a podcast called um, the Mother Baby Nutrition podcast um yes no <laughs> it's not so what it's called it's the mommy and me nutrition care podcast <laughs> i was like oh that doesn't sound right <laughs> it's the mommy and me nutrition care podcast it's there, on you Apple and Spotify. there you um, go spotify there's also a link to it on my website <laughs> um the reason i say that is because the my signature program is um the Mommy and Me Nutrition Care program, it's trademarked. Okay. It is a 12-week program for moms where they get three individual sessions. They get 12 weekly group sessions. Okay. And they also get access to my 12-module video course where we dive into specific uh, general nutrition, fertility nutrition, pregnancy nutrition, postpartum nutrition, breastfeeding, breastfeeding nutrition, transitioning to solids, um, and a lot of guest interviews and stuff in there related to that. So it's a very comprehensive um, video education that moms get access to in that program. So the 12-week program is for everybody? Everybody uh, can do So it. any, whether you're in fertility phase or postpartum mm -hmm. or pregnancy? Yeah, or, absolutely. You know, uh, yeah, I guess it'd be postpartum. Yeah, and it th three months, that 12 weeks is really a sweet spot for most people because you're learning a lot and you're implementing and it takes time to implement. And you, if you make one small change a week for 12 weeks, then you look back at that and you've made 12 changes. It's huge. That really add up over time. Yeah. And the great thing about that is if you do start to come in in the fertility phase, you have access to that um, educational video course that you might not need the pregnancy and the postpartum aspect of it yet, but you have lifetime access to it that you can reference back when that time yeah. does come. And we also include um, my one of my very good friends is a pediatric physical therapist, and she's created a course called Take the Monster Out of Milestones, which goes through um, baby's developmental milestones, and I've included that in the program as well. So not only do you get the nutrition education, but you get the, the developmental milestone education from a pediatric physical therapist as well. Amazing. So it's just a really to toot my own horn but i think it's a really great program <laughs> no it's a, i mean goodness gracious i want to take it like, and it sounds amazing. if there are any moms in the state of tennessee right now that are on tin care or uninsured and low income um, my nonprofit, the mother baby nutrition foundation is offering scholarships for moms to go through that program amazing so we have we just had two moms apply for the scholarships, and it's about a, it's almost twelve hundred dollars scholarship that mm. moms get to go through this program, and because um, that's that's about the cost of the program is twelve hundred, so the scholarship covers all but seventy five dollars. So we ask that moms that are um, recipients of the scholarship pay twenty five dollars a month. Um, so right now we still have one open scholarship, and then we're also applying for grant funding so that we can provide more scholarships to moms. So if you're in the state of Tennessee and you're on ten care or uninsured and low income please go to um, motherbabynutrition.org and fill out an application. So cool. I'm so glad to know you. This is amazing, Alex. What we'll do, guys, is we'll link all those socials to Alex as well as her website as well as the nonprofit and her 12-week program in the description below. Alex, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Guys, you name it, we explain it. As always, we'll see you all next time. Don't go away.